So when I was a kid, my dad and I had a backyard garden. We had a couple of rows of carrots and green beans and other vegetables in our big experiment to try to grow our own food. <clears throat> and one day, my dad and I were out, and we were shoveling compost. And I was sitting on, a, uh, sitting on a rock playing with a pitchfork. And I was taking this pitchfork, and I was jamming it into the ground and pulling it back out, and jamming it into the ground and pulling it back out. And I jammed it into the ground one more time, and then I realized something had gone horribly wrong. And I looked down, and I discovered that I jammed the pitchfork through my big toe. And so, so yeah, I know, all right? <laughs> so naturally, it got horribly infected. And before long, my mom had to cut a big chunk out of my shoe, so my big toe had somewhere to go. Um, the moral of the story is, growing your own food is hard. <laughs> so luckily, I lived in a context where food was readily available. And the fact that my dad's and my garden didn't grow very much wasn't that big a deal. But access to nutritious food is one instance of a class of problems, like access to clean water and high quality education and um, good health care, that would be challenging to address in the absence of the industrial systems that surround us. How would you find food here in Southern California if there weren't a well-stocked grocery store down the street? Or how would you find water if there weren't large-scale pumping systems bringing water in from other places? Or how would you fix a punctured toe without access to a hospital? These things, food stores, water pumps, and uh, and hospitals are all instances of a broader class of thing called infrastructure. And here in the developed world, we don't often think very much about infrastructures that, that, that surround us and provide for our needs, but we're all deeply reliant on them. And unfortunately, infrastructure has a couple of problems, and there's two main problems I wanted to bring up. First, infrastructure relies on large external inputs of energy and other kinds of materials. And second, a lot of those resources have to be brought in from other places. So they're not, um, they're not uh, found right around here. And this wouldn't be a big deal if resources were infinite and if the world never changed. But unfortunately for our infrastructures, these resources are inherently finite, and the world is constantly changing. And in fact, it's changing more than we, we realized even a couple of decades ago. Our growing seasons are shifting as the climate changes. Our sea level, as sea level rises, it's changing the uh, coastlines around us. And here in Southern California, our landscapes are being transformed by the greater incidence of wildfires. And these environmental issues carry with them other social and cultural changes. So they could lead to economic disruptions and social unrest and wars between countries. And all of these things, the environmental issues and the cultural and social phenomena that accompany them, could potentially disrupt the infrastructures that we rely on. And some scholars have suggested that if we don't have the resources to address these disruptions, they could eventually lead to broader scale societal collapse. Now, when I say collapse, I don't mean apocalypse. Apocalypse is like a movie with Nicolas Cage and a shotgun defending his family from some looming threat. Um, collapse, on the other hand, is a phenomenon that's been studied by archeologists and anthropologists, and it takes place over decades or sometimes even centuries as a society, um, as a society contracts as resources become less available. So this has been a topic that's been talked about a lot around under the title of sustainability at various points. For the last several decades, sustainability has been a big topic of discussion. But recently, some of my colleagues and I have been starting to ask a different question. What if sustainability doesn't work out? So I would propose that if sustainability doesn't work out, if we need to adapt to these new ways, of, ways that the world is, we need new ways of living. We need ways of living that don't just rely on relatively few resources, but they need to also rely on local resources. And in my research group, we've been starting to call these collapse compliance systems. And it's been a growing emphasis in the kind of work we've been doing. And we're not doing this under the absolute certainty that industrial civilization is going to crumble around us in the next five years, but rather we're doing it as a kind of insurance policy. Because that does seem like one possible direction the world could go. And it seems prudent to have somebody working on those kinds of questions. And so when we're building these systems, we're focusing on quality of life. And I want to draw a distinction here between quality of life and standard of living, another term that sounds sort of similar. Standard of living is a measure that's based on stuff. It's how much material stuff we have. 
Whereas quality of life is a measure of our subjective experience of well-being. And I want to give an example. One core human need is close human social contact. So basically having friends. And a lot of companies would have you believe that if you buy these fancy jeans that we make, then you will have more friends. <clears throat> this is a process called manufacturing desire. It's causing your desire for a basic human need to be hitched up to, to attached to the desire for their product. And the fancy genes are part of standard of living. The, qual the friends, though, are part of quality of life. And the reason why this is an important distinction is that standard of living is inherently resource intensive. Whereas quality of life, you can improve your quality of life without necessarily needing more stuff. So in our work, in this building of collapse compliant systems, we've been focusing on basic needs. What are humans' basic needs? And in fact, we've been moving beyond that to not just basic human needs, but looking out for the quality of life of all of the other species that share our ecosystems with us. <clears throat> now this is a challenge, because it's a very large scale problem. It's a challenge because there are billions of people who all live in different places with different access to resources and different cultural histories. And it's a challenge because there are interdependencies between all of these. If you solve one person's basic need, it may compromise somebody else's basic need. And it's a challenge because people are inherently bad at scale problems like this. We evolved to solve individual problems, like where are we going to get our next meal, or how are we going to avoid danger, or how are we going to find a mate. The ways that we think don't necessarily scale very well, and that makes it challenging for us to solve these kinds of problems. However, we have an opportunity, which is that modern computing systems effectively are scale machines. They're things that have been designed to be good at scale. And so that, in particular, is the research focus of our group, is looking at how we can design collapse-compliant systems using modern computing technology as our, as our entry point. We're doing this, though, with an awareness that computers are infrastructure, too. They're manufactured overseas and shipped all sorts of distances and uh, are made out of all sorts of raw materials. And so what we want is to use these modern computing technologies to help design new ways of living, but not necessarily to have those new ways of living rely on those computers for their ongoing operation. So I want to tell you about just a couple of sample projects that we're working on in our group. One is a project called the Sustainable Polyculture Composer, and it's led by uh, my PhD student, Juliet Norton. And this project is designed around the idea that you should be able to have a custom ecosystem in your backyard to support food production. Um, so here's a screenshot of it. And the vision behind it is you should be able to type in your address into, Google, into the website. It pops up your backyard on Google Maps. And then it guides you through the process of finding various different species, collections of mutually supportive species that can produce food for you and other, uh, and other uh, resources that you might need while mutually making the, the other species able to thrive. Her broad scale goal is to enable local, safe, nutritious food for lots and lots of different people. And she's very interested in having this be an educational product as well, so that people learn about the species they're planting and how to care for them, so that the computers are not needed as an ongoing piece of the project. You put the, eco the ecosystem in place, and it continues to work even without the computer thereafter. So this project is very much still under development. It won't be out for a couple of years, and it's not going to solve all of the problems in this space. Um, it's not going to keep you from jamming a pitchfork through your toe, for example. Um, I wish. Um, but we hope that it's at least one step toward more sustainable local food production um, in a collapse-compliant way. So a second project we have underway is led by Kevin Simonson, a med student at UCI. And this project is about computationally optimized aquaponics. So aquaponics is a combination of two things, aquaculture and hydroponics. Aquaculture is basically fish farming. And hydroponics is a way of growing plants without soil. And so the vision behind it is that there's this big grow bed and a fish tank underneath it. And you feed the fish, and the fish poop. And then the dirty water gets piped up, and that fertilizes the plants. The plants, meanwhile, are cleaning the water, which then drizzles back down into the fish tank. And it's a closed system where you get plants out of it and you get fish out of it in exchange for sunlight and fish food. And it's um, apparently much more water efficient than conventional agricultural techniques. And what Kevin and his team are working on is looking at how to use microcontrollers to optimize this process. What's the right way 
of pumping the water up, what's the right rate, what's the right rate of feeding the fish, things like that. But similar to Juliet's project, technology is not absolutely required for the ongoing use of the system. If you had it in place and all the computers broke, you could still move the water from the bottom to the top with a bucket. So these are just two examples of work that's going on in our, our group. And there are various different projects that are happening around the world where people are trying to address aspects of quality of life with scarce resources. And what we're, uh, several of my colleagues and I are working on is a new educational initiative to try to push forward some of these ideas and bring these ideas from around the world to bear on the University of California community. It's a new course called Global Disruption in Information Technology. It's one of, a, one of the first in a class of new online courses being offered across all nine University of California undergraduate campuses. And we're having this course be project-based. So st students will be working in teams from day one to build projects around these ideas of disruption and collapse compliance systems. So imagine if on your way to the dining hall, there were an aquaponics rig and you could see the spinach and the lettuce and the tilapia growing that would be on the menu. Or imagine if all of the landscaping in the UC system were replaced with a computationally designed food forest and thus provided for a lot of the resources for the dining hall. So this course will be offered for the first time in winter of 2015, so about six months from now. And we've made a simple landing site, uh, ucdisruptioncourse.org, where you can go and type in your email address and we'll send you a reminder to register. So these are just some of the ways that you can get involved in this work. Whatever kind of work you do and wherever you live, I encourage you to join us in thinking about these problems and helping build collapse compliance systems. Just because resources become scarce in the future doesn't mean that well-being has to. Thank you.